Okay, the recording has begun. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Effective Evaluations. Our presenter today has been a Toastmaster for 22 years and is currently a member of four clubs. During his time as a Toastmaster, Kevin has served in every club office as an area governor or director twice and as a division governor once. He is a two-time distinguished Toastmaster and will earn his third DTM later this year. He has been honored in District 8 in the past as the Toastmaster of the Year, Division Governor of the Year, and Retired Toastmaster of the Year. He has also won contests at every level in the district and has won the District 8 Evaluation Contest three times and the District 8 Table Topics Contest twice as well. When he was working, Kevin's managers heard he was in Toastmasters and started asking him to critique their presentations. Despite being an electrical engineer, it became part of Kevin's annual goals at both companies he worked for to attend other managers' presentations and give them a blueprint for becoming a better speaker. Since retiring, Kevin has become a speaker, author, and coach. His first book, Bridge Over Adversity, True Stories About Overcoming Personal Challenges, was published in October of 2021. He also works with organizations and individuals to elevate their speaking skills to the next level. Kevin recently served as one of the deans for the National Speakers Association, St. Louis Chapters Speakers Academy. Kevin also has six grandchildren, plays competitive table tennis, and is a budding magician. Please welcome Kevin DeRoysers as he shares with us his template for evaluating speakers and helping them become the best speaker they can be. Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Curtis. Have you ever given a speech at a Toastmasters club, sat down, knew immediately four or five things you could have done better, and then the evaluator gets up to give you feedback and they say, RJ, that was just a great speech. You did this well. You did that well. And I really can't think of anything to tell you to improve. Those are the milk toast evaluations that I try to avoid because every time I speak, no matter how well I think I spoke, there is something I can get better at. And the same for you. And as evaluators, that is the key to improving our fellow Toastmasters because feedback is important. Toastmasters is unique because it gives you that immediate feedback. And we have to be good at that in order to help our fellow Toastmasters. So here's what we're going to discuss today so you can become a better evaluator. I'm going to talk first about the purpose of evaluations, why we do them. I'm going to talk a little bit about club versus contest evaluations because in some ways they're different and in some ways they're the same. There are three styles of evaluations that I'm going to discuss and you have to pick the one that's right for you. Now, a lot of people always tell me, I don't know what to look for in evaluation. I'm going to tell you 12 different items you can look for when evaluating somebody. So you have an idea going into that speech, what to look for to make that speaker a better speaker. I'm gonna discuss my note-taking method during a speech and how I assemble my evaluation because that's critical too. I am in a club where the first evaluator goes immediately after the speech. It's like table topics on steroids. And I have no problem doing that because of my method. And if you look at this method, you decide you like it and use it, you'll be able to do the same thing. Then my template on how I format my evaluation. Now, templates become a dirty word sometimes in Toastmasters. I don't sit there with a form that's got this, 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 and this on it, but I follow a certain script whenever I give an evaluation. I'm gonna share that script with you. And then how to deliver an evaluation. There'll be discussion afterwards. If you have questions, feel free to interrupt me during the presentation. So what is the purpose of an evaluation? First of all, is to provide positive feedback, and that's the most important part. We don't want to just give things that the speaker can improve on. We want to make sure they know what they did well, and we can reinforce those good habits for them. 
but it has to be balanced with providing them opportunities in a constructive manner because we want to give them ways that they can improve. Now, keep in mind, when I give an evaluation, it is my opinion. It is not necessarily gospel. So when I get an evaluation, somebody evaluates me, I take that and I say, yes, they said my vocal variety could be different or my pace could be different. But I may look at that and I may watch the recording of that speech and say, you know what? I like that. I thank them for the idea, but I don't incorporate it because it is an opinion. I've given speeches in contests before as a test or pattern speaker, whichever you prefer to call them. And I'll get the first evaluator come up and say that my gestures were perfect. They were in the strike zone. They were wide enough. They were this, they were that. And then the next person comes up and says, your gestures could have been broader and they could have done this, could have done that. And once again, it's an opinion. So one person may look at it one way and another another way, but we have to keep that in mind when we receive the evaluation too. But the most important thing about evaluations, it's about the speaker. It isn't about you. Have you ever seen an evaluation where somebody get you talk about Mount Everest and then the evaluator gets up? Yeah, I went to Mount Everest five years ago and we did this, we did that. And, and they tell their story and they waste all that time talking about themselves, not about the person being evaluated. Don't fall into that trap, please. Make it about the person you are evaluating and in an uplifting and positive way. Now, club versus contest evaluations, there are a few differences. So at the club, you know ahead of time what the objectives of that speech are if you're a good evaluator and you read their project. Then you have the opportunity, and I hope you do this, to ask the speaker what they want you to look for in their speech because they may be working on a specific thing for that speech. And you have an evaluation form that Toastmasters provide you for that speech. But a contest is a little bit different. You have to surrender your notes after five minutes. You start with a blank piece of paper. You don't have a template, a format, or questions in front of you. And other people are judging the same speech. For when you give a speech in a Toastmasters club, generally, you're the only person giving that evaluation. And for a contest, there is a strict set of guidelines that the judges look at to determine if your evaluation is the best in that contest. But in the end, the principles of a good evaluation are the same, whether you're giving it in the club or if you're giving it in the contest. It's the content of the evaluation, the constructive feedback that you give, the positive reinforcement you give, and how you give them a roadmap to get better. So there are three main styles of evaluations. I use the first, which is the sandwich method. And I will start by giving strong points for the person's speech. Then I will give them opportunities. I don't say you can get better. I use the word opportunity because they are opportunities. I don't want to make the person feel bad. So I use probably the least offensive wording I can. And then I close with their strongest point because the sandwich method is you build them up, you bring them down just a little bit, and then you build them up again and leave them feeling excited and energized, wanting to go out and get better. I like the sandwich method. That's what I've used for all of my evaluations ever since I started Toastmasters. That's what my mentor taught me. But a lot of people successfully use the as I method. And that is, as I saw you, I saw you walking across the stage doing this, and that was effective because, or as I heard you, you, you talk about as I type statements, and that's good too. And then Toastmasters, when they came out with Pathways, came out with a pretty generic evaluation form. It's you excel at, you may want to work on, and to stretch yourself. And I like those three components, but what I don't like about that method is how people follow that in that order because they start with what they did well at and then it's here's what you need to work on and here's something you can do to stretch yourself so it's not lifting up the person at the very end it leaves the person feeling down so this has its place but i would reorder it if i mm -hmm. use what you excelled at what you may want to work on and to stretch yourself 
and try to end on a positive note. So I promised you 12 things to look for. And, and to me, this is something that I've, I've given this out. Anybody that wants a copy of this, if you email me, and I will put this in chat later, Kevin at bridgeoveradversity.com, I will email you a PDF of this, the 12 things you can look for in a speech. And it's a pretty detailed list. It's not just 12 bullet points. So it starts with vocal variety. And we all know what vocal variety is, but some people just think it's volume, but it's also pitch and rate and tone. So did they vary the aspects based on what was happening in their speech? A lot of times a person says, I was excited about this, not I was excited about this. So there's a difference when you're saying something, the vocal variety has to match what you're saying. And pauses are so important. Have you ever been listening to a speaker and they go on to the next point and you still haven't completely digested that other point? So watch for how they pause and transition so the audience can catch up and stay on pace with what the speaker is saying. Because a lot of times I'll be trying to jot a note or remember something that somebody said, and then they're making a key point that I just missed. And when they say they're excited, did they sound excited? And I talked about that just a little bit earlier. And what was their tone like? You know, was it something that was conversational? Was, was the speech appropriate for it to just be kind of a two-way conversation almost? Or did they have confidence if they were presenting something that they were the expert on and they were trying to teach us? Uh, did they sound like they were lecturing us? And sometimes that can be good. Sometimes that can be bad. But th these are just some, th some things to look for. And could they be heard by everybody? Sometimes when we're sitting in the back of the room, we can't hear somebody or they just have a very low voice naturally. Eye contact is important too, but you don't want to stare at people. You want to make sure you're moving around the room. And do they look at all portions of the audience? And do they avoid eye contact or stare at the walls, floor, the ceiling, or are they constantly looking at their notes? One thing I will often suggest to people in my evaluation that do not have good eye contact is find a few friendly faces in the room, people that are smiling, people that are obviously engaged. And then those are the people you look at and find one of those in each portion of the room or each portion of the Zoom screen if you're on Zoom and just kind of move around from person to person. But mostly on Zoom, you're gonna be looking at the camera. So you're gonna be looking straight at that camera as opposed to the people on your screen. But you'll learn who the people that are engaged and your friendly people in the audience are. Gestures, we all know that. Were they appropriate? Were they too tight or wide? Uh, did they help create a picture in our mind or did they seem forced? Sometimes the gestures just do not match what the person is doing in their speech. And when they're not gesturing, I see people constantly clasping their hands or twiddling their thumbs, or some people play with their hair. They put their hands in their pockets. When they're not gesturing, what are they doing with their hands? Because we look at those things, and those can be distractions in a speech. Movement. Did they use various parts of the stage to connect with the entire audience? And on Zoom, did they come in? And we've seen Brad Adams do this extremely well from Crossroads Toastmasters in contest. You know, you can use one side of the Zoom screen. You can use another. You know, how do they use the screen? How do they use the stage? And then did they move with purpose or randomly? You know, people that pace back and forth, or do they set the stage for different parts of that? So what I like to do when I'm giving a speech in person and live is I will have a story. I will plant myself in one portion of the stage for that story. And then when I finish that story, I will pause, walk to another part of the stage and start a second story. And then I will do the same for the third story. And now for the visual learners, I can point back to that first spot when I was talking about that first story. And when I was talking about this and they remember that because the visual learners, if you point to that spot, that will cue them and they will remember what you're doing. So. Those are different ways you can teach people to use movement to be very effective. And pacing back and forth obviously is a sign of nervousness or could be. Opening and closing. The most important part of your speech is the opening. If you don't grab your audience's attention right away, you've lost them. 
what did I do in my opening here today? And I'm going to open this up. Did anybody notice something I did? You tell a story. Told a story. What else? He asked a question. Didn't asked a question. But I also told you what you're going to get out of this. We're a very selfish society. I told you what's in it for you. You're going to get the 12 things to look for an evaluation. You're going to learn methods that will help you give better evaluation. So what I'm trying to do is not say I was a, you know, I won the district evaluation contest this many times. I did this. I did that. I didn't make my introduction that I gave about me. I left that to the person introducing me. I told you right away what you were going to get out of this, because according to Stanford, I think it's Stanford or MIT, I forget which one, you have 20 seconds, 30 seconds max to capture your audience's attention. They decide in that time if they want to listen to you or not. So did you have an effective opening or not? And did the closing tie everything back together? So in a speech, if I have a lot of unanswered questions, Craig Valentine, who was the 1999 world champion of public speaking, teaches in his courses, you always want to make sure there are no questions left unanswered for the audience. So you have to look back at your speech and determine what questions you opened up in the speech and make sure you answer those. And that's a good thing to look for because we don't want to walk away feeling unfulfilled. You know, I've had people that will give a speech too. I'm going to give you the five keys to this. And now that seven minute red light comes on. They've only done four and they stop and they say, and they do their conclusion. So they don't go over time. I feel cheated because I didn't get that fifth point. I never, and I, I say this in evaluation, don't tell people unless you know you're going to get through them. I know I'm going to get through these 12, but don't say I'm going to give you five things if you know you may not get to those five things, just say, I'm going to give you several key points you can do to do this, this, or this. And now if you miss one, you don't have time for one, then the audience doesn't feel cheated. So that's something I've used in an evaluation before when somebody ran out of time and just rushed at the end. Hey, Kevin. And, yes. There's one question in the chat room. I believe it's about the movement section, but it it's from yeah. Sherry Nelson. It says, what about when you speak at a conference and there is a fixed camera for the hybrid portion? You're, you're a little bit stuck there, but what I like to do, generally, if you have a fixed camera for a hybrid portion, it's not zoomed in where it's just like my head right now and that's all you can see. Hopefully that camera is set up so you can be standing and it's, you know, you have a little bit of room for movement. And I'll test that. So I do a lot of hybrid meetings for National Speakers Association. We, we record ours with the meeting owl also. And I'm their tech advisor. So I will get the speaker. I will show them at this part of the stage, you go off camera. At this part of the stage, you go off camera. So here's, you can walk between these two points. I'll even put tape down on the floor for that. So you can teach people, you know, and that's the key to preparation. You get there ahead of time for your speech and you see where the camera is set up and where you're on camera, where you're off camera, and you hopefully can see yourself on camera so you can see, am I too big, am I too small, and what movement do I have? Is my head cut off or am I cut off at the knees? You know, so you can see that. It, it's all preparation, and that's something you can talk about in evaluation too. I've had people, they're talking heads, so all you see is their head down here like this on the camera when they're speaking, and you know, I like to get my body up here so when I move my hands up, I, my gestures can be seen a little bit. Does that answer your question? I'll assume a yes, unless you put something else in chat. Yes. Um, okay, good, we Sherry. Struggle, we struggle with this at our hybrid uh, club meetings. Uh, I know during COVID, uh, I attended a conference that they weren't set up for movement on the screen. And one of the speakers kept walking down towards the audience and they would be off screen and it was just maddening yeah, it to is. sit there and hear this voice in the whatever. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so and thank and you as a speaker, that's our responsibility to understand, you know, the stage ahead of time. And, and that's fair game for an evaluation too. And, and that, that's an excellent point because so many speakers do, they get off camera and they don't realize the people watching the meeting 
can't see them now. Okay, so stories. Darren LaCroix, who was a 2001 world champion of public speaking, his mantra is tell a story, make a point. People remember stories. They don't remember if you're just spouting facts and, and figures to them. If you can weave it into a story, then they remember it. So look for opportunities for your speaker to use stories to make their points. And did the stories contribute to the speech or were they random? Did they flow? But I always compliment people. I find it as a strong point when people use well-crafted stories to make a good point in their speeches. And did they tell each story from a different point on the stage? So I talked about that earlier. If I have three stories in my speech, I'll start in one spot of the stage, I'll move to another for the second story, another for the next. And now for the people that are visual learners, you can do that visual recall by pointing back to that spot. So these are some things you can look for in somebody's speech. Do they utilize the whole stage? And when they have different stories, are they in a different spot for each one? And did they have the opportunity to use the story so we could have understood it better and enjoyed learning what we learned more? Or you know, was the story not appropriate for that speech? Facial expressions are important too. I watch a person's face. So when, when they talk about, I was excited, did, did they just say, I was excited, the voice didn't match it, the eyes didn't light up, you know, they didn't look happy. I've seen some people up there giving a speech and their face is just somber the whole time, but they're talking about the best vacation of their life. And I wanna see some excitement in that. If I don't see that excitement, it's hard for me to get excited with them too. And did the facial expressions augment their speech? You know, we can use facial expressions, you go, you know, there are different ways you can use your face, not just a gesture. And was it friendly? So we're drawn in. Some people, you know, they just don't look approachable when they're speaking. And we need to work on that. It's, it's hard. And this is a, a tough one to talk about because some people, you know, no matter how hard they try, aren't going to look welcoming in that. But, you know, if somebody, you know, has a good smile, and has a more friendly demeanor and can do that, that might be something you will bring up in a speech. Passion, this, this one I always look for, is was the person passionate about what they're speaking about? Because if they're not passionate about it, why should I be? If you're not excited about what you're talking about, it's hard for me to get excited about it too. And it help, it's contagious. When I'm passionate as a speaker, that passes off onto you as well. Organization of the speech, and this is just straight out of any speech manual from Toastmasters, you know, did it flow well? And I, most speeches in Toastmasters I hear flow well. I think we learn well, but sometimes the speech just bounces all over and I have a hard time determining what the purpose of the speech was. And then there's audience engagement. Do you engage the audience? Do you ask questions of the audience? Are you use, utilizing, and I'm not doing that too well today, but are you utilizing chat when you're on a Zoom call to get answers to questions? Are you doing polls in Zoom? Are you asking rhetorical questions? Are questions where you want the people in the audience to answer so they're a little bit on their toes? Because when you start asking questions to your audience, and especially when you ask for an answer, after the first one, people say, oh gosh, he's going to ask questions. I better be paying attention. That just kind of gets them going subconsciously so you grab their attention just a little bit better. So you want to engage them not just in the beginning, but you want to engage them periodically throughout the entire presentation or speech. So once again, more things to look for. Did they speak with confidence? There are some people that, you know, their posture, their gestures, their facial expressions, their voice all exude confidence. Do they, feel, do they look like they're commanding the stage or do they look like they're just saying something they don't really believe in what they're saying? And that could be a sign of nervousness. And no evaluation in today's world. We talked about hybrid a few times would be complete without online presence. So was the lighting appropriate? You know, is their face well lit? Uh, was the background clean? You notice I have kind of a white clear background. So the focus is on me. You look at Curtis, He's framed well in there. He's got the lighthouse on one side and he's got the text on the other. And as a photographer, I know that 
funnels my attention into Curtis's face. So that's a good background because it funnels people to look at you. So you don't want something coming out of your head. You don't want lines or, you know, a tree or something coming out of your head when you're on screen. Did they look at the camera? So when you're online, are you looking at the camera? Are you looking down at notes? Or are you looking off to the side at your cat that's in the room with you? Was the audio clean? So that's something that we have to listen to. People will tolerate bad video. They do not tolerate bad audio. And was the camera focused? So sometimes uh, I had a meeting Thursday night for uh, one of my online undistricted clubs. And the person that was speaking, their camera was out of focus. And I finally just quit looking at the screen and just listened to them because, you know, it was, it was hard to watch them. And do they utilize app specific tools to engage the audience? So when you're on Zoom or one of the other platforms, you have chat, you have the ability to have them turn their cameras off and on, you have the ability to do various things. So you want to make sure you're utilizing those tools to keep the audience engaged. So those are the 12. If you want them, email me, don't put it in chat. Uh, email me at kevin at bridgeoveradversity.com. I'll put that in chat at the end of my presentation and I will send you a copy of that. Okay, my note-taking method. And this is what has helped me win three different evaluation contests for District 8. I call it the one, two, three, four, five method. And what I do is I start with a blank piece of paper, even if it is a club evaluation. I jot down points as the speaker is going and I put a plus or a minus before each one. And if it's really strong, I'll put two or three pluses by it. If it's a tremendous opportunity for that speaker, I'll put two or three minuses next to it as well. And then after the speech is over, I just number the top things I am going to cover in my evaluation because I only cover five things. I cover three positives and two opportunities. So this is what my sheet looks like. And, and this is from an actual evaluation a couple years ago. You see the pluses and minuses. And you know, if you can't read my chicken scratch, that's fine. But basically what I do is I jot down what they do. And because it's recent, I, I remember a specific example so I can talk to it. I don't get into, when I say great energy and passion, I knew what the story was that cued that. So I will bring that up in the evaluation itself. And I create this. And then at the end of my evaluation or at the end of the speech, all I do is put a one, two, three, four, and five on there. And those are the five points I am going to cover. So the first two are always things that they did well. The next two are opportunities and with them is what's in it for me. So they didn't at the beginning of speech tell people what was in it for them to get that hook in and to grab the audience's attention. And then at the end, I thought they had a very powerful ending. So I closed with that on my evaluation. But that's that's how simple it is. I look and see you know, where I have three pluses and minuses, and I know those are going to go into my evaluation. And within a minute of the speech being over, I have an evaluation ready to go. I have one, two, three, four, five. Now, I don't necessarily have it memorized. There's nothing wrong with bringing up a piece of paper. But in a contest, when I have that five minutes to prepare, all I'm doing is remembering what one, two, three, four, and five are so I can do it without notes. But there is nothing wrong with giving an evaluation where you have the notes by your side and you just look at it for a second to figure out where you are and go on. But this works well for me. You may have a different method that works for you, but I just really like doing this and writing down the pluses and minuses as I go because, like I said, I can give a table topic style evaluation that's very effective immediately after somebody gives a speech. And one of my clubs does that. And, you know, this lends itself to that extremely well. Any questions at this point yet before we go on to the next portion? Kevin, there is a request in the chat that you will, will you send this example along with your um, 12 Yeah, yeah I'll also. send the power, I'll, I'll send the whole PowerPoint. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, but I'm also gonna send the, I have the 12 things to look for in a speech in a PDF. I will send that separately so you don't have to go through a whole PowerPoint to get that because that's just a, a two page document, I think. One or two pages, I can't remember what it is now. But yeah, I'll okay. send both. If you just send the request, I'd be happy to. Does that yeah. make sense to people? Okay. 
So next, my template. And my template is simple. My evaluations almost always go between three minutes and three minutes, 15 seconds. Because I start with a general comment about what I liked about the speech. And I might say something like, you know, Marilyn, I really enjoyed your speech because in today's, in today's climate, everybody needs to hear a positive story like that. So I just give a general thing on why I like the speech. And it has nothing to do with evaluating it, but it's just an icebreaker. It's one sentence, maybe two sentences. Then I will go with a specific positive aspect of the speech, not their most their strongest point, but a positive aspect that I put that number one by. I'll do a second positive aspect of their speech. The first opportunity, the second opportunity, what I like most about the speech. And when I say what I like most about the speech, I will show some excitement in my voice. And I'll say, what I like most about your speech, though, was, and then I'll talk about that. Because once again, just like when I'm looking for that in a speech that they sound excited about something, I want to sound excited about what the best part of their speech was. And then this is what most people miss, a short summary of my five points. Because when you give five points to somebody, they're listening to the third and fourth, they've forgotten what the first two are. So you want to summarize that. Same in a speech. When you give several points in a speech, you want to close with a summary. So you know people remember the first thing they hear and the last thing they hear. So that summary is important. And the reason I won the 2008 District 8 Evaluation Contest was because of this. On the judges sheet, which I'll show you in a few minutes, there are 15 points given for summarizing your evaluation. And I drew the infamous number one. So I was the first evaluator in the contest of five people. So I had to play, and I like drawing that in the district finals because I got to see the other four evaluators. And the person that had won the year before, and he'd already won it twice. Afterwards, when I won, he came up to me, Kevin, you saw both of our evaluations. Why did you win? And I didn't. I said, I told him, I said, Bob, your evaluation was phenomenal, but you did not summarize. You left 15 points on the table. If you had summarized, you probably would have beat me. And I think he would have. I thought his evaluation was a little bit better than mine, but he didn't summarize. So that gets to the point of what makes up a good evaluation. This is the judge's sheet for the evaluation contest. And I don't care if you're in a contest or if you're in a club, this is how you should structure the points you make. 40% of it should be analytical quality and the recommendation is 30. So 70% of it is analyzing what they, what the speech was about and how they can, what they did well and how they can improve. The technique, you know, your delivery, uh, your own demeanor when you're delivering it is only 15% of it. And the summary is 15% as well. But the meat of it is in what happens and what you're giving in the way of recommendations. And I'm not saying that how you deliver it isn't important, but you really need to focus on this. And to define that better, you can print this out off the Toastmasters International website. The back page of it defines it for you. And it tells you exactly what analytical quality is. It tells you exactly what recommendations are. It tells you what technique is. So it is a very good tool to help you know how you should balance your evaluation so it's the best possible evaluation. And I say, don't use this just for contests. If you follow this template on the judges sheet, if you focus on this right here, you're going to give a very good evaluation, and you're going to help that person improve as a speaker. And in the delivery, oh, and, and this is for a speech too. When I get introduced as the evaluator, I wait until the general evaluator, or if I'm giving a speech, the Toastmaster is seated. You want all attention on you when you're giving your presentation or you're giving your evaluation, you're giving your table topics. 
Because if there's a distraction, there's somebody walking off to a chair, people aren't completely focused on you. So wait a few seconds until all the focus is on you. And when you're quiet, it forces people to looking down like this to look up to say, what's going on? And then now you've got them. Because Mark Brown, who's another world champion of public speaking, almost always starts his speeches with five to 10 seconds of silence to get people focused on him. And that the timing doesn't start then because he's just being silent standing there. In an evaluation, it's different than a speech. This is a about the person you are evaluating. So look at them 80% of the time, roughly, 75, 80, because you're talking to them. I, I like to make it conversational. And when you do that, you know, you have to not just stare at them the whole time because that'll make them feel awkward. So you have to look around the room a little bit. But if you see them you know, maybe fidgeting a little bit, make sure you look away from them. But this is a conversation between you and the person you're evaluating. It's not a conversation for the whole room. So I focus strictly on that person. And communicate both verbally and visually. So when I am talking about, you know, your gestures were a little bit tight, I'll move my hands in tight. So when I am telling them how to improve, when I talk about movement, I will do that movement on the stage myself and show them. Because once again, there are three ways to learn. People learn by listening, they learn by seeing and they learn by doing. And it's hard to get people to do, but if you can get two of those three in your evaluation by people hearing and seeing, now you're getting to more people. You're communicating more effectively with more people. And that's what the speech as well. But once again, like I said, it is about the speaker, not you. Please, please, please don't make the evaluation about you. I've seen so many evaluations that way. They drive me up a tree and I'm sure I'll see some more, but not from you guys after listening to me today. So that's all I have and we are open for discussion. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I will put my email address in the chat as well. So chat and I'll put my thing. Any questions? Uh, Kevin, this is Nate Randall. Hi, Nate. Okay, been a while. is there a natural resting place for your hands when you're moving it around? It, it depends on the person. Sometimes it's hanging by your side. Other times it could be just kind of, I'm going to move back a little bit. Sometimes it could be, you know, like this. Uh, most of the time, just by your side is fine. It's just when you start doing the distracting things, like brushing your hair, putting them in your pocket, you know, people that are twiddling their, th I, I've seen, I, you know, in the last few months, I've seen three people twiddling their thumbs in between gestures. It's like, you know, Whoa. I didn't know people still did that. <laughs> but you want to take away, and the other thing too, when I give a speech or an evaluation, I take everything out of my pockets. Um, yeah. I wear a cross all the time. I keep that inside my shirt. I don't want to offend anybody. You know, some people aren't religious. I, I have a cross that I wear, but I do not when I speak for, or I'm speaking to the Maryland Heights Chamber of Commerce in a couple of weeks, and I will not be wearing anything offensive. I take everything out of my pockets. I don't pe want people saying, oh, what's that in his pocket? What's that hanging from? Oh, his cell phone's hanging from his belt. And they're looking at what kind of iPhone is that? I want all focus on me. And that's another thing I bring up with people too, is you don't want any distractions. I don't wear my dangly earrings when I'm giving a speech because I don't want it catching the light and shining and having people glance and see what the heck that is. <laughs> Some wow. of you are laughing. <laughs> RJ, I can see you laughing. And Curtis too, okay. <laughs> what else? Hey, Kevin, great presentation and good good examples. I really enjoyed it. Uh, one. One quick comment to kind of add what you said that helped a little bit, and people often overlook on those new evaluation sheets that Toastmasters created for the pathways. That back sheet goes down a list of stuff that you can actually look for, kind yeah. of copies the old legacy program we used to do our speeches on. Different yeah. uh, variety if you want evaluation. another good resource, just Google competent com communicator manual, Toastmasters competent community, and those 10 speeches are the building blocks of every speech. I, I completed that 23 times because that is how you learn to speak. You need, if you have never seen the Competent Communicator Manual, get it, it's, you can find it in PDF form on the internet. Uh, if you email me and you say CC manual, I will send that as well. So what I will send when 
you email me is my 12 things to look for in evaluation. I will email you a copy of my PowerPoint presentation in PDF. And if you ask specifically, I will send you a PDF copy of the Competent Communicator Manual. You said CCP manual? Uh, competent Communicator, yeah. It's just CC manual, yeah. Competent Communicator Manual. If you just ask for that, I'll send it to you. And, okay. you know, I'm not good at going through chat and getting email addresses. So just email me at that email address and I will get it out to you sometime this weekend. And Kevin, I, I have been taking notes from the chat and I, I'll get a copy of that also and send it to you. So you'll have all those. There's some Thank comments you. out there too um, about your evaluate, your presentation, talking about how awesome it is. So that was great. I wanted to ask a question just about, you focused on gestures, you focused on on using your speaking space and stuff, but what about clothing? Is, is there a time when you might want to wear dark clothing, light clothing, a suit, casual clothing? that kind of stuff, depending on who your audience is? A lot depends on who your audience is. You, you want to be dressed appropriate for that audience. Uh, when I speak to business organizations, I, I will call ahead and talk to the event planner or the person that hired me to speak and say, what will everybody be wearing? And you don't want to be underdressed. You don't want to be too overdressed either. But if you're an expert teaching a topic, you do want to have that certain level of dress. Now, one exception, you know, I've seen people wear bib overalls for a speech, but it fit the speech, it fit their personality. So, you know, a lot depends on the speech, but it mostly depends on the audience you're speaking to. Okay, thank you. Did that answer your question well enough, Curtis? Yes, thank you. Good. Hey, Kevin, uh, this is HK. Uh, yeah. When the speech is so boring and so messageless, uh, really really boring uh and you really want to evaluate do you still want to make sandwich uh, evaluation and find some positive in it yes i do you, uh, you know the purpose of toastmasters and, and you know our mission we're, we're here to be supporting each other and do it in a constructive way i can always find something good in a speech just the fact that they had the courage to give up and give a speech or the topic that they chose. You know, there, there are certain things that are go-tos for me that I will give, you know, especially people giving early speeches early on in Toastmasters where they aren't too well versed in speaking. Uh, I will compliment them on volunteering right away to give this speech. And to, so you can find something. You want to build them up though, and you want to end with something building them up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Kevin. This is Anne with Triton Toastmasters. Hi, Anne. I have a question regarding some of the unconventional speaking projects or some of the projects that are very, very long, like 20 minutes or more. Mm -hmm. Do your evaluations vary at all for those types of speeches? No, because we still get two to three minutes for that evaluation. And, you know, it's, you know, I have a longer set of notes to choose from. It's a little bit harder to whittle it down to five. But at a certain point, unless something really uh, strikes me, I quit taking notes because I've gathered enough information in the first 10 minutes to get what I need. And just a quick, quick story on what this did for me. Uh, I was teaching a class at Anheuser-Busch. I worked there. And our vice president of operations, Pete Kramer, would kick off that class to show the importance of it. We brought in people from all the breweries. And he comes up to me and says, Kevin, you're a Toastmaster, you speak at conferences. Can you evaluate my presentation to your class? And I said, sure, Pete, I'd be happy to. At the end of the day, I gave his secretary a five page report on his presentation. Didn't hear from Pete for a week. A week later, Pete pokes his head in my office door and says, hey, Kevin, what are you doing next week? And I said, I hope I still have a job after that evaluation. And he says, oh yeah, I said, Will you fly on the corporate jet with me to our Williamsburg Brewery? I'm delivering communication meetings and help me develop my speech as we go up, critique it, and give me feedback on the way back. And I said, well, I got to ask my boss. He says, he works for me. You're going. For the next six months, he was inviting me to meetings I should have never been at. They were way above my pay grade, but I was his personal speaking coach. Then he had me do his directors. And... Then when I changed jobs and went to another company, I told my boss about it. He says, well, our boss is horrible at public speaking too. 
why don't you talk to him and evaluate him? I did. And that's where it became 30% of my job. I was doing his direct reports. I was doing their managers. And that was on my annual review because of Toastmasters, because of those 12 items or whatever items you learn from evaluating. So you can translate things in Toastmasters to do that. And now I coach people, business people on public speaking. I will either help them develop speeches. I will watch their presentations and critique them. And I get paid good money for that. So you can do the same because it's not rocket science. You watch a few of these evaluations and I've seen people that are every bit as good as me in Toastmasters as evaluators that could make a lot of money doing this. What else? We got a little bit of time. Linda. You're muted, Linda. On your notes, I, I noticed that on some of your notes, for instance, uh, number three, I don't have those notes in front of me. I'm just doing this from memory. You had uh, a three positive note, but underneath it, you had some sub notes and you had some positive sub notes and some negative number sub uh -huh. notes under that number three. How do you use those sub notes? Well, I, because when I give an evaluation, I want to give a, a few details. And when I have something that's got three pluses or three minuses, a lot of times I will jot a few sub notes in there because I don't want to just say your vocal variety was good. I want to give examples of their vocal variety or I want to give examples of their stories. So, and if, even if there's an, a negative in there, yeah. you have another negative, um, like number four is your opportunity one. Mm -hmm. You yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, now another thing too, and I didn't bring this up in my presentation, but one, it, let's say somebody gives a phenomenal speech. One thing I will do as a way to improve, your gestures were great. However, if you would just take it to that next level, they could be even better. So now you're giving them a suggestion on something. You take a strength and you tell them how to make that strength even stronger. Because too many people, all they focus on is the negative things, where if you focus on a strength and develop that, it's going to be a lot more effective than developing some of your weaknesses. So sometimes as an opportunity, I will take one of their strengths and encourage them to make it even stronger. So when you're really searching for something in an evaluation that they could improve on, look at some of their strengths and see how they could possibly improve that strength a little bit. And Maurice, you hit it, good to great. Right out of that fantastic book. Absolutely. Okay, Kevin, this is Nate again. Yeah, Nate. Um, if the bulk of variety is not there, and do you put the suggestions on how to improve it in your evaluation? And again, if it's at a club, do you turn it into a coaching minute? A minute? I, I turn it more into a coaching minute. And you're going to find if I do a written evaluation view, you'll probably get a Word document along with it. <laughs> you know, just Because they don't give you enough space to type what you need to type in there. And, and it's not just the things they can improve on. It's the strengths as well. You know, I will go into more detail on those. I, I wish Toastmasters wouldn't limit the characters in those little boxes when you're talking about people's strengths and opportunities and how they can stretch themselves because you can't effectively convey the message sometimes in that small little box. But yeah, I, I'll use it as a coaching moment and I will demonstrate if I can in the evaluation, but then I'll go into in the verbal evaluation, but I will go into more detail in the written. Kevin, that answer your uh, question, okay, Nate? Sounds good. Thanks. Uh, it, this is HK again, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, when uh, the speech is uh, uh, good, but uh, you have uh, you're more experienced in the subject matter as an evaluator, and you know how the speech could be better, would it be part of the evaluation to suggest the speaker what some points they could add to the speech? To make it even better. Besides, that's just, one I tread lightly on because you never want to show up the person and act like the expert and correct them and say you miss this, you miss that. That's something I would probably do privately. I 
you know, once again, it's about the speaker. It's not about you. It's not about my knowledge. Uh, they're giving the best speech they can from the knowledge they have. I might suggest, you know, you know, I heard there's some other topics around this that you that may supplement that or whatever. So it is something that you can bring up casually, but be careful about showing up the speaker by showing off your knowledge. Okay. Hi, Kevin. Yes, Deanna. Um, so my question is, uh, what would be your advice to somebody who's new to giving evaluations and they're evaluating somebody at Toastmasters who's more experienced in speaking? It might be kind of nerve wracking to, you know, give an evaluation over somebody who is much more experienced. Mm -hmm. The first thing I would do is I would talk to them ahead of time and, and let them know, you know, I'm a little bit nervous about this, but I want to get my feet wet. Uh, the other is, as you're watching other evaluate, when you're at a meeting, write out your own evaluation sheet, even though you're not the evaluator, and see how it compares to the evaluation the person gave. Maybe you'll have some better points in them. Maybe you'll have some points that, uh, you know, that probably after rethinking it shouldn't be made. So practice evaluating beforehand, but also talk to the person and when when evaluators come and talk to me ahead of time, especially the newer ones, you know, I, I will give them some things to look for. And I, I will tell them one thing I know I do just about all the time. I don't care how hard I work on it. I join sentences with the word and. And I say, if you look for that, you're going to find that. So if you're looking for something that that's a gimme. So I, I will kind of help them out. I'll throw them a bone because I haven't given a speech yet where I haven't joined sentences with and. OK, thank you. And if you figure it out, please let me know. I can't figure it out. I'll let you know. <laughs> Thank you. And we are, I put the green sign up. We, I was going to give you five minute warning at the 10 minute point, And that's where we're at. So you have about nine minutes left for the whole session. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got one for you, Kevin, kind of touched on coaching. When you do your note taking, especially at the club level and you're using the evaluation sheet or even a blank piece of paper, do you usually take the time to send that to them or email that to somebody after you've done it? Yeah, I'll generally just give it to them. Or, or if there's a Xerox, Xerox, I guess that's not the right, a copy machine or something. You know? <laughs> uh, if I want to keep a copy, I'll take a picture of it with my cell phone so I have a copy to look at it. But but it's about them. It's, you know, it's for them. So I will give that to them. Have you ever gotten feedback on your evaluation feedback? Feedback yeah. on my evaluation feedback. Yes. So when you've given someone an evaluation and sent them something, have they ever mm -hmm. sent anything back to you saying, hey, even a, you know, a thank you, but, but specifically anything that helped you even evaluate better later? Yeah, I Probably have over the years. I can't remember. I know occasionally I'll get a reply. Usually it's just thanking me, but uh, and I've actually had a couple disagree with me on some things. And then I, I just respond back and say, you know, I appreciate that. It's just my opinion and you have to do what's right for you, what you feel most comfortable with as a speaker. This is HK again, Karen. Sure. Uh, if you make uh, the notes, sometimes I notice people just read, looking at their notes, not looking at the speaker. Uh, to what extent should you not look at the notes and just speak? It, it's, it depends on your comfort level. It's a process. So you, you know, when you're first starting evaluations, you need those notes and you're going to probably have to look at them and that's fine. We all understand that as Toastmasters, but as an evaluator, you need to work towards needing the notes a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less. It's just like our first speech, our icebreaker. A lot of people, when they give their icebreaker, have notes and they have their whole speech written out or they have note cards with bullet points on them. But after giving three, four, five, ten 10 speeches, the notes disappear. And that's how an evaluation is. You, you, you have to start somewhere. It's baby steps. You have the notes maybe the first time. 
And then the next time, maybe you just look at the main point for each of the five points you're making. Uh, next time after that, uh, maybe you only have to look at it for two on down the line or four or five times down the line, whatever it is. But you want to strive for that. But if that's the point you're at and that's the best evaluation, you give it that point, you look at the notes. The most important thing is getting the feedback to the speaker that's going to help them reinforce the things they do well and help them identify some opportunities. So whether you have notes or not, the bottom line is you have to be helping the speaker. In a competition uh, evaluator, uh, what happened? Is that reading counts as a negative point or just? Uh... It's not on the judging criteria and I can't speak for the judges. I do not hold that against people unless they're reading, you know, if they're reading their whole evaluation when I'm a judge, you know, that's in the delivery form of it. But if they're just looking at a note occasionally, when I'm in a contest, I don't use notes. I, I keep them by my side in my pocket or something in case I get completely stumped. I forget something, my mind goes blank because at my age that does sometimes. But uh, there's nothing in the judges criteria that says you can't use notes. Thank you. Kevin, this is Frankie. Um, I'm from California, actually, but I'm a member here at Mount Vernon in Illinois. Hi, Frankie. I just wanted to thank you so much. I've been a member since 1988, and I still struggle with evaluations. This was an excellent, excellent uh, presentation. Thank I you. also, um, I've heard it say an evaluation is like a mini speech. So you still have to focus on an opening, the content, and the closing. And this template and the note taking and the delivery, these are, I'm looking forward to grabbing the recording off of the D12 website. And I've requested your notes too, but it, it was just excellent, excellent. And I learned a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, this is actually the second time I've given this for District 8. They asked for an encore performance. I gave it a couple of years ago as well. And it's slightly changed because every time I look at a speech or every time I look at a presentation and I reread it, rehearse it, I say, oh, wow, I could change this word or that word. Or I can take this out right now. That <laughs> at some point, I quit looking at my speeches because I'm going to just keep changing it every time I look at it. Well, Kevin, we have, we have about three minutes left. I wanted to ask you. Um, what pushed you toward, I see you have a lot of accomplishments in table topics and evaluation as opposed to, you know, international speech, tall tales, humorous speech. What pushed you toward evaluation and table topics versus the other opportunities in Toastmasters for speaking? Well, the evaluation uh, portion of it was when I started doing that at work, you know, I, you okay. know, I wasn't going to enter the evaluation contest again, but then I started doing that at work. And then I had two other people that had one say, hey, we're in different divisions. Let's see who the best evaluator is, you know, <laughs> but between the three of us, both of them got knocked out at division. And oh. I want to say, I'm never going to do it again, but I've been coaching people now. So I entered it a few years ago, just as a credibility marker. Uh, you know, I, I, I've tried international speech contests. I've just run into better speakers and I, I realize there are better speakers than me out there. Uh, we have some tremendous speakers in District 8, and I've made it to the finals a uh, few times, but I haven't won uh, international speech. I, I am good at one-liners. I'm not good at humorous speech, and I should probably challenge myself and try that, but I just have avoided that. <laughs> and tall tales the same way. I, I really enjoy table topics and uh, evaluation, though. Thanks. And as an evaluating expert the best evaluation you can do is one on yourself which is what you just did so with only two minutes left and seeing no other questions in the chat or no other hands raised we want to stop and thank kevin for this excellent presentation on effective evaluations as we said yep we can give you a hand as we said the recording will be available on the district 8 website in about a week and for those of you who still need kevin's address it's in the chat and i will also pull the requests that were made in the chat and send those to him. So make sure that he has all of your emails that he can send you his notes. 
So thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Have a great rest of the day. And now, if you'd like, you can go back to your to the general chat room and, and back to the conference. Or if you want to stay and talk with Kevin a little bit more, you can. Thanks, Kevin. You're Thanks, welcome. Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin, this is Christine. Yes, Christine. I, you might have addressed this in the beginning. I had to update my Zoom and it took a minute to log on. So I got on it uh, two minutes late. But were no you problem. always uh, a great speaker or did you join Toastmasters to kind of get skills you didn't have or you felt like you